Hey, I'm Molly Burke, and I might not look like it, but I'm pretty much completely blind. In a room of blind people, I'm usually the second most blind. Blindness is a very wide spectrum. It starts at the legally blind mark, which is 20 over 200, meaning what you could see from 200 feet away from, uh, that person would have to be 20 feet away from. If the room has large windows, and if somebody happened to be standing against that large window, I could see somewhat of a shape. Somebody like me has photophobia. So photophobia is severe light sensitivity. So it's kind of a catch-22. Light helps me see a little bit more, but I'm also extremely sensitive to light. A lot of sighted people would experience photophobia when they go from a movie theater during the day and they go outside after spending two hours in the darkness. And they're like, oh my God, and it really hurts their eyes and it takes a while to adjust. That's what I experience pretty much every time I'm in sunlight. It's really hard when you have vision loss uh, as a child because that's all you know. You don't know how to tell people, I don't see that, because you think that that's what everybody else is looking at. In my case, I've been fully night blind from birth. So in dim and dark lighting, I've always been completely blind. But then during the day I could see, so I was just like this normal kid running around. Soccer was a really great sport for me because the ball was black and white against green field and so I could really track the ball very well. They called me a bit of a ball hog in soccer. If I lost the ball, I probably wouldn't be able to find it again. So once I got that ball, I stuck with it. I think I was around 11 years old when I really noticed myself sitting in grade six that I wasn't seeing as much as I had the previous year. Everybody with my disease is completely different. And so in my case, I ended up losing the majority of it when I was in grade eight at 14. So I began uh, pre-braille training, which then led to learning braille. Pre-braille training is finger strengthening and sensitization. So braille is, uh, you know, it's a very delicate language. You're feeling these very tiny dots with the tips of fingers. The things that they would do to help train my fingers to be sensitive uh, would be things like having a book of fabrics and they would have me identify which two of the six fabrics were the same fabric. And increasingly as they would flip the page, the materials would get closer and closer to the point where it would all be velvet, but I would have to find the two that were the most similar texture of velvet. I started taking O&M. O&M, or Orientation and Mobility, is basically helping blind people learn to navigate space. So for every blind person, this is going to be different. For somebody like me, it was learning to use a cane, so different styles and techniques, but also on top of physically navigating, it would be navigating through your auditory listening skills. So when I was young, my O&M instructor would do things like blindfold me and have me walk down the street and count trees based on listening to what we call sound shadows. Blind people a lot of times will use either active or passive echolocation. Active echolocation is where you click, you snap with your tongue, uh, you can use a metal clicker to create sound waves bouncing off of objects around you in space. I was trained in passive echolocation, which is where uh, I do not create a click, I just use the natural sound waves created by the universe to determine what's around me. So if you take your hand right now and you close your eyes and you run your hand by your ear, you can hear that it blocks sound. So that's really what I'm looking for with my passive echolocation. I'm walking down that hall and it's blank. I'm hearing that blank noise of the wall and then all of a sudden that noise opens up for a new hallway or a doorway. You're gonna wanna put on your headphones right now because you are going to explore space through sound.
wait. I think everybody has the ability to hear as precisely as I do, to feel, to smell, to taste as intensely as I do. They just don't focus on it. A lot of people assume, you know, you go blind and you get a guide dog, but that's not what it's like at all. Um, you have to go through those years of O&M training to even be considered for a dog. I went to the Mira Foundation in Quebec they looked at everything from my cane skills to my auditory skills, my spatial awareness, how comfortable I was around dogs, what type of dog would fit my lifestyle. And then when it comes to teaming you up, they look at everything from your walking speed to your personality. How much do the dog and you connect? So you spend, depending on the school, anywhere from two weeks to a month living there. Uh, day on day, waking up early, doing six to eight hours of training together as a new working team. My current guide dog, Gallup, I have had for five and a half years, and he went through two years of training prior to me even receiving him. Good one, Ever? Yep. Gallup, put your harness on. Way, oui. bon chien. Every single guide dog is trained to be on the left side of the handler. In my case, I happen to be left-handed, so it kind of worked out well. And it's basically for flow of traffic. All of Gallup's commands happen to be in French because he is from Quebec, Canada. So I'm gonna be speaking French. Gallup debout. Bon chien. So basically, I hold the leash kind of hooked under for easy access if I need it. I stand like this, so he's a little bit in front of my body, and then he's able to guide me, and I just feel it all through here. So we can go, virage, which is where I've turned around. Virage, bon chien. So a lot of it is a combination between words, body language, and sounds. Other things I can ask Gallup to do is find stairs, find a chair. That one has a person in it, Molly, <laughs> careful. <laughs> I've taught him to find Starbucks. I've taught him a couple English words. So I've taught him front door. So when we're in my neighborhood walking around, I can say front door and he'll take me to my apartment. He's memorized the mall with me. So him and I wander around the mall and we just know where every store is. It's weird, sometimes he'll go to stores that I like don't even know where are located. I'm like, oh, Let's go to Aldo. And then he like walks me to Aldo. I'm like, can this dog read? It's actually terrifying sometimes, but you're very sweet. Hmm? He's an animal and you know, he's gonna make mistakes. It's not always gonna be perfect. For example, uh, one time at JFK airport, Gallup had explosive diarrhea in the hallway. Uh -huh. What can you do? He's a dog. Sometimes they get sick. Stuff like that you definitely can run into with a pupper like him, and he was so embarrassed, bless his soul. How, how He's like, Mom, don't tell that story. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, babe. It happens to the best of us, hmm? It happens to the best of us, I know, I know. I do my own hair and makeup, and I do it through touch. And a lot of people think, if I'm blind, I shouldn't care about tattoos, or makeup, or fashion, or room decor, but I love those things. When I went blind, I just had to find ways to make it work. And that's really when I found YouTube as a viewer. So for fashion, it's about quality, it's about fit, it's about fabric, it's about construction. All of those things matter so much more to me than it's trendy, it's fast fashion. My mom always gets irritated because believe me, I will fly, find a flaw in anything with my hands. You won't even be able to see it with your eye, but I'm like, do you feel this right here? There's a little pull in the thread. And my mom was like, oh my God, I can't even see that. <laughs> when it comes to beauty, for me, it's really about self-care. Being with myself, it's art, it's expression, it's showing the world who I am on the inside, outwardly. A bold lip makes me feel powerful. A soft lip makes me feel feminine. My space buns make me feel funky and fabulous and quirky. And I love being able to show everybody who I am on the outside. 
When I decided I wanted to start wearing makeup, my mom took me to a makeup counter. And she had the makeup artist do my makeup, pick all the right colors for my skin tone, create a look that was really age appropriate. That was my big Christmas gift that year. She bought all the makeup that the artist used on me and the brushes. And I remember I would just sit on my room on the weekends and I would just play with it and I would practice and I would go downstairs and my mom and dad would in a loving way burst out laughing because I would have mascara trailed down my face. That was always the hardest part to get used to. And then when I was working in high school, I would go on the weekends and I would meet up with the girls at the Mac counters, buying all the latest collections. And that's how my, I would say, potentially hoarding makeup tendencies began. For me, there's two things that I look for when I'm trying a new product out. How it feels. When I touch my face, does it feel like skin? Or am I feeling a little too oily? When I touch my lashes, do they feel crispy? Do they feel like they're, you know, getting clunky, chunky together? Or do they feel really soft and plush still? So that's what I'm looking for, number one. Number two, I'm looking for feedback. If I notice, wow, everybody's complimenting my eye look whenever I wear cool toned eyeshadows. I start to think maybe cool toned eyeshadows are a good look for me. Gorgeous. Goes really well with the eyeshadow, the overall look. That was my hope. Thank you, Neve. I have a lipstick holder, and all of my lipsticks are in that holder, and it goes in categories. So, you know, the first row is the nude pinks. Lightest nude pink to boldest nude pink. Coral. Lightest coral to boldest coral. And it just goes in categories. People are still shocked when they see me, like, on my cell phone. Of course, we all love things like Siri and Hey Google. I use a program called VoiceOver, which speaks out everything that's under my finger or under my keys. And so I'm able to navigate and just through my finger scrolling around the screen, I'm able to text, check email. The only thing that isn't accessible is if an app has not chosen to be accessible. I used Siri and I asked her to turn VoiceOver on for me. I basically just move my finger over the touch screen and it says whatever's underneath it and then messages. say I want to open the messages, I double tap to open it. Words. Speaking rate. So I can change the speaker right. So now it's at 100%, so it's as fast as it can go. Google Maps, Fitbit. So I can still hear that at 100% speaking rate. I can also turn it really slow. Which is usually how CITES have to listen to it. Safari. Safari. Oh, it sounds so slow. I can't, I can't do it. When I'm meeting somebody, I'm paying attention to their handshake. And that doesn't just include, you know, is it a good, strong, firm handshake? That includes how big is their hand? Um, how soft is their hand? If it's a large hand and it's calloused, I'm going to start to paint the picture of, okay, this is maybe a kind of burly man who does a lot of work with his hands. And when I shake it, do I hear bracelets? clinking on the woman's wrist. Okay, she's probably into fashion. And then on top of that, I'm listening to the sound of their voice. How tall do I think they are based on where I'm hearing the sound come from? I can usually determine the age based on their voice. When people become friends with me, there's, I'd say, a couple things that change over the course of our relationship. Number one, they start to feel more comfortable laughing at my blind jokes because they realize it's okay to laugh. Also, they become instinctively more descriptive with their language. It's a, it's a tree. You can see I can turn it off and on here. It's cute. Yeah. Sighted people, they connect through a smile, through eye contact. And although a sighted person can still feel that connection with me through those things, I don't feel it back. And so for me, I like to do things like, you know, touch their arm or put my hand on their knee, that kind of thing, because it makes me feel that true physical connection to that person. Now the touchy thing can definitely be problematic on a date because that's just my way of connecting with a person. It is not a sexual or romantic gesture for me personally. Uh, so for me, I'm like, don't take this the wrong way. This is just how I'm choosing to connect with you. Going on a first date, there's a lot of things I have to think about. Number one is safety. There are some staggering and terrifying statistics about the amount of disabled women who are raped and sexually assaulted and abused by men. That is something that, you know, I think we all need to be aware of and think of, but when you are disabled, 
it's tenfold. So I'll suggest a location. And on top of kind of destination, I think of how loud is it? Because I can't see. So if it's very loud with lots of people and music, now I can't see or hear. So this is gonna be a really uncomfortable experience. So I try to think of somewhere that's gonna be kind of calm. If I, I really prefer daytime dates because it does give me uh, a bit more light, which potentially will allow me to see a little bit more and make me feel more comfortable in that way. So there's a lot of things that I take into consideration when going on a first date that the guy will never even know. <laughs> When you are interacting with a blind person, the number one thing is don't grab them. And that's very jarring and scary. I don't know you, therefore I don't have a lot of trust. And if you're pushing me across a city street, that doesn't feel very safe for me. Sighted guide is the appropriate way to assist a blind person, whether it's crossing the street, navigating through a restaurant, whatever. And so the way to do that is to offer an elbow. Put your hand on their shoulder and say, hi, just wondering, I noticed you know, you're know, you at the sidewalk for a while. Would you like some help crossing the street? If they say no, believe them. If they say yes, you can say, I'd like to offer you my elbow. And then you put your arm out. We will grab your elbow and we will follow you that way. When talking, uh, if you're in a work environment and somebody who's blind has started working there, every time you talk to that person in the in the staff room, in the kitchen, wherever you are, say, hey Molly, it's Sarah from HR. Hey Molly, it's Sarah from HR. And after time of that happening enough, I'll just know your voice and I'll know who you are, so you won't have to do that. A definite don't is touching the guide dog and talking to the guide dog. A lot of people do things like, I know I can't pet you, but you're really cute and I really want to, and I'm like, the reason you can't pet him is because it distracts him and that is just as distracting. I know it's tough, especially because it seems everybody is a dog lover, but the best thing you can do is ignore the dog and speak to the human. Horseback riding and downhill skiing are my biggest passions uh, hobby-wise. Growing up, I was very athletic. I played pretty much every sport and activity imaginable. Rep soccer was truly like, it felt like a part of my identity as a kid. But as I slowly was losing my vision, I was becoming a danger to myself and my teammates. That was really tough on me. And so my parents knew that every time they took away an activity, they needed to fill that gap in my schedule with an accessible activity. And that's when they replaced it with accessible downhill skiing. I ski with a guide behind me. If the hill's busy, they'll yell my turns. They'll say left, right, stop. But if not, they'll be like, you just, you ski. And I will ski and I will feel free. And I go really fast, because I love going really fast down like a black diamond, just barreling down. Honestly, most sports you can find a way to accommodate. Cycling, tandem bicycles. Baseball, beatball. And then there's things like goalball, which are a specific sport for the blind. Goalball is cray cray, highly recommend looking it up. It's nuts. There's this really hard, heavy rubber ball and there's bells inside. And you whip the ball at the opponents on the other side of the court and you dive for the ball with your entire body, which means you could get smashed in the nose, in the crotch, or anywhere else. Dangerous sport, my friends, play at your own risk. Ride sharing apps have made a world of a difference in terms of my ability as a blind person who cannot drive. However, every single, every single time, I have to be scared, worried about, consider the fact that they might deny me access into their vehicle because of my service dog. By law, they're not allowed to do that, but it doesn't stop them from doing it they would just see me realize that I was gonna be the one getting in their car and they wouldn't even stop. It's really hard because my service dog isn't a choice, my service dog is a need. So if I'm with a friend or a family member and we order a ride sharing car, I will hide. I will literally hide. Then once the car arrives, whoever I'm with will open the door so the car can no longer drive away and I will begin to approach. At that point, whoever I'm with begins to explain to them, this person is blind, she navigates the world with a guide dog, the guide dog will lay on the floor. We cover all the bases. You know, usually 
if they're gonna argue it or try to deny me, that's when they just go, no dog, I don't accept dogs, I can't have a dog, he's gonna pee in my car, he's gonna bite me, what if he's dirty, I can't have hair on the seats for future riders. The amount of things that people have tried to tell me as reasons why they won't let my dog in their car is absolutely absurd. It's so frustrating. And the thing is, by law, as a guide dog user, I have to keep my guide dog clean and well behaved. And I do those things. My guide dog gets groomed every six weeks professionally, uh, which is as much as I'm allowed to because he has dry skin. He smells delightful. Because trust me, I don't want to be the blind girl with the smelly dog either. So some things that I utilize on a daily basis that are built into our environment around us are things like, I call it sidewalk braille. It's the bumps at sidewalk crossings. So that is designed as a tactile marker for blind people. Vibrating sidewalk crossings. I push the button, I hold my hand on it, and when it's time to cross, it'll begin to vibrate under my hand and I know it's time to go. I also use braille signage a lot. Braille buttons on elevator doors, washroom doors to say men's or women's, things like that. Currently, I'm lucky enough that I you know, can afford to do a food delivery service. So every single night, my meals are delivered to my door that I just put in the fridge, get out, and I can either heat it up or just toss it into a bowl, which makes life so easy with my busy schedule. But in terms of grocery shopping, uh, currently I also live in a full service building. They will do grocery shopping for you and put the groceries in your fridge once a week. Alternatives to things like that would be Instacart. A lot of cities now have Instacart, which is great for blind people. But also, if you're just somebody who loves going into the grocery store yourself, you can always go up to the help desk in a grocery store. I used to do this when I lived alone downtown Toronto. I would come in with my shopping list and one of their staff would walk around the grocery store with me and say, you know, I see you have olives. We have these kinds of olives. This is the price of these different ones. Which one would you want? And they'll put it in the cart and they'll help me until I'm ready to head home. Netflix is definitely where I do most of my media consumption outside of YouTube. Netflix is really dedicated to audio description for the blind. All Netflix originals have audio description and quite a number of their licensed programs as well. And that's basically a secondary audio track that plays alongside the show or the movie that describes things that you might miss as a blind viewer. They kind of fill in some of the gaps for you. What was the beginning? In archival video, men swim, drive, and ice skate with cheetahs, lions, and tigers. Alien people are nuts, man. I love that now Netflix offers so much described video because that wasn't something that was available to me growing up. And I realized how much as a child I really was missing out on. Now, it continues to get trickier and trickier because of the use of fake service dogs, the misuse of emotional support animals, um, and honestly, the misconceptions around disability. I don't look blind. I don't look disabled. They just assume that I'm another one of those fake service dog users or misusers of emotional support animals. I have pretty much always gotten asked, oh, are you training that dog? And I'm like, no, he's my guide dog. I'm blind. And then it's inevitably ends up being like a 25 minute conversation where they ask me all the things they've ever wanted to know about blind people. And I have to educate them on why all of these stereotypes and misconceptions they hold due to the way media has historically painted blind people is in fact not true. But honestly, even though it takes time out of my day and it can be frustrating sometimes, that's my passion. It's the reason I make YouTube videos. It's the reason I post every day on Instagram. It's the reason I am a public speaker. It's the reason I wrote my audiobook because I'm passionate about education because I believe education is the key to breaking down so many barriers and the discrimination that disabled people still face on a daily basis. I prefer for people to just call me blind because it's what I am. People seem very afraid of the B word. They wanna call me like, she's visually impaired. She doesn't see as well. Blind is my reality. You're not the first one telling me. I am aware of my situation. You can just say blind. I always try to make it clear that I'm not speaking for blind people. I'm speaking for Molly and Molly is blind. I am sharing my personal experiences 
and what I can share about my community from what I know living in and growing up in the community. There's so many blessings that my blindness has given me that I wouldn't trade for anything. And I think I have a better sense of self and a better direction in life and more passion than any other 26 year old I know. And I wouldn't have that without this. And honestly, I don't know who I'd be if I got my sight back. And I don't wanna know because this is who I believe I was meant to be and the life that I was meant to have. And I'm able to actually create change through that. And that's a beautiful thing.